Are we on? Yes, now I can hear myself. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. It must be uh, time on the dot. Thank you very much for being here. This is DCIM B379. My name is Jeff Woolsey. I'm a principal program manager in the Microsoft Cloud and Enterprise Division. I've had the pleasure of working on hypervisors and virtualization now for the last 17 years, 11 of it at Microsoft. Before then, I was at a small startup in California doing virtualization um, long before most people knew what it even was, uh, way back when it was a science project. Um, and it was interesting, way back when people wanted to run things like DOS and Windows 3.1 on their Apple Power Mac 6100, 7100, and 8100. So not only did we do virtualization way back when, but we actually did binary translation from x86 to PowerPC and back, which is actually far more difficult than just straight up virtualization. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna be honest with you, I got about 20 hours of content that I'm gonna try and squeeze into 75 minutes. Um, I haven't done this session in quite a while, and I was asked, I was like, hey Jeff, you, we should probably do a, an update on where we are these days uh, in 2012 and 2012 R2 because there's so many changes. And one of the things I've heard from customers and, and talking with customers, honestly, is they've had a hard time keeping track of all of the changes because there's been a flurry of, of work that we've been doing in terms of uh, cloud, uh, private cloud, and all of our cloud OS vision. I'm gonna talk briefly about the cloud OS. Gonna talk, want to do, spend a quick moment on ecosystem updates and we are gonna power right on through software-defined compute, software-defined storage, software-defined networking, and more. Um, the first thing I do, I do want to do is start with cloud OS. And the reason why is really simple. Um, I know we can have the checkbox war. Um, honestly, I've been, like I said, I've been at Microsoft for 11 years and I've been having the checkbox war. And the checkbox war is literally, folks like to bring in a laundry list of checkboxes from other companies and basically say, look, here are all the features that are super, super duper important. Most of the time it's a small subset of those features, but they have to put all of the checkboxes on there so we can have this little checkbox discussion. I'm ready to tell you I'm ready to have the checkbox discussion whenever you want, okay? Honestly, I got more checkboxes than anybody has, but honestly, that's to me is like a 10-year-old discussion. Um, what you really want to be asking yourself is this, where do I want to be next year, five years, 10 years? Where do I want to be as a business? Where do I want to be as an IT professional? Is it still having the checkbox work? Don't think so. It's much bigger than that. Um, and it starts with how we think about the cloud and how we think about the cloud OS. At Microsoft, the cloud, it's really simple to me. It's very straightforward. And I always start off with this because I want people to be crystal clear with how we think about the cloud OS. We think of it as three legs to a stool, okay? It starts with the private cloud. And the private cloud is Windows Server and System Center. And I always talk about them both because everyone likes to focus on the hypervisor. Don't get me wrong, I love hypervisors, they're awesome. It's what I've been doing for a good portion of my career. Love it, they're awesome. But if you're not actually managing this, you're missing the bigger picture, okay? Platform is Windows Server, but System Center is not only how you manage, deploy, lifecycle manage your cloud infrastructure, but it's about those applications. If you're running SQL, if you're running Exchange, if you're running SharePoint, if you're running Dynamics, if you're running Link, best, guess what? the best way to manage those is with System Center. Because those teams, SQL, write the management packs that go into System Center. Not some random team, the team that actually develops those applications and workloads. There is no team that knows better how to manage and monitor those workloads. Okay, so it's very straightforward. When I think about the private cloud, I can easily describe it in one word, and that one word is control. I'll talk with customers. I was literally in Europe a few weeks ago for tech days in the Netherlands, and I spoke to a customer who says, Jeff, I've got a workload that has to run in a German data center by a German citizen on German soil. Are you gonna try and argue with me and say that I need to push this up to Azure? And my answer is absolutely not. This is not a technology discussion at all. This is a data sovereignty, this is a compliance, this is a regulatory reason. It doesn't make business sense, so I'm not gonna push you to that. Let's help you build the best private cloud together. That's Windows Server and System Center. At the same time, we've been very open and, and upfront with everybody. We are making huge investments in the public cloud. Keynote was a perfect example of that. I mean, literally yesterday, it was feature after feature that was hybrid cloud after hybrid cloud after hybrid cloud. And guess what? That's just building on all of these things we've been doing in hybrid cloud. We are clearly leading in this area. And when it comes to public cloud, the public cloud I can describe in one word. That's scale. What we are delivering in Azure today is planet-wide services, full stop. 
Brad mentioned this yesterday. There are three companies delivering at that scale. Three. Us, AWS, and Google. Spoiler alert, none of them use VMware. Two of them use hypervisors that you can't get. You can't get Google's hypervisor. They don't provide it to you. They've done custom stuff on open source work, and how much have they given back to anybody else? None of that. AWS, same spot. Azure, and what we deliver in the public cloud, is Hyper-V. It's what we give you. It's actually based on Windows Server 2012. We haven't even gone up to R2 yet. Trust me, they're working on it. But guess what? That's Hyper-V. We call it Azure. We don't call it Windows Server in the cloud because we deliver it as a finished service. We deliver PaaS, SaaS, and IaaS. Okay? We deliver virtual machines. We give you finished services. That's why it's called Azure. It's not called Windows Server in the cloud. We also have service providers. And service providers give us customization and reach. Just yesterday, I spoke to a customer who asked me this exact question. Jeff, I have a specific workload. I would like to put in a specific server and a specific rack uh, in a specific location. Can I do that with Azure? And unfortunately, that's not how we work at Azure scale. At hyperscale, at cloud scale, we are buying in Azure literally servers at thousands at a time. A rack is tiny. We don't even think in those terms. We can't deploy in those terms. We're literally doing thousands of servers at a time. So if you want to say, hey, I need that specific thing, guess what? We have a cloud OS network of service providers that are happy to do that around the world. They can give you that customization and reach. The reason why this is so important is because when we think about the cloud, it's this whole thing. Folks will tell you, some folks will tell you, cloud is private cloud. It's running it on your premises. We'll sell you software, you run this, you set up your private cloud, that's cloud. Other folks will say, no, that's not cloud. If you talk to Amazon, Amazon will say, no, it's running virtual machines up in an Amazon cloud. If you talk to Salesforce, Salesforce will say, that's not cloud. Salesforce will say, SaaS. They'll say, running software as a service up in the cloud is cloud. And we say, that's all nice, but you're thinking about it in these very narrow terms. And I understand why. It's because you don't want to actually face the big picture here, which is when you think of cloud, it's all of the above. It's public, it's private, it's service providers, it's all three. And when customers ask me, I get this question all the time, Jeff, in five years, where are we going to be? Is it all public? Is it all private? My answer is always yes. Okay? There will be some that are all public. There will be some that are all private. Most everybody will be in the middle. It's a slider. Some may tend to public, some may tend to private, but they will be in the middle. It will be a hybrid world. Guess what? What did we just spend yesterday focusing on the keynote? What are we spending focusing on in the work that we've been doing this week? What are we talking about? And guess what? What do our customers resonate the most with? This message. Because you know what this means? This means I get the cloud wherever and whenever it makes business sense for me. We're also focused on consistency. You saw the Azure Pack in the keynote. We got lots of Azure Pack sessions this week. It's one of the hottest topics at Microsoft these days because people realize I want to be able to deploy my on-premises private cloud. Service providers want to be able to deploy their clouds that, guess what, that have a consistent look and feel to Azure. Because today, I go to Salesforce, I go to Azure, I go to my own on-premises private cloud. Each one of them has a different experience. And the beauty of Azure Pack is it's not just giving you UI. We've packaged up Azure Pack and given you, you know, code from Azure, but we've also given you services as well. Do you want SQL delivered as a PaaS service in your private cloud? Guess what? That's what we deliver in Azure Pack. Do you want MySQL delivered as an Azure, as, as a PaaS service? That's what Azure Pack delivers. Do you want IaaS VMs in your private cloud? Again, that's what Azure Pack delivers. And here's what we, we've already delivered multiple releases of the Azure Pack. And guess what? As we deliver more features in Azure, guess what? We're going to continue to give you more features in Azure Pack. We're just literally going to light up new features. The point I like to make is, when Azure first released many years ago, Azure on the left hand had only a couple icons there. It had a few things up there. And over time, we added more and more and more features. Well, now we're releasing these at an alarmingly fast rate. It's we are constantly releasing new services. And guess what? There's so many there that there's now a slider on the left-hand side. There's now a scroll bar there because there's so many features. Guess what? Azure Pack's the same way. It's got about five or six icons on the left. Guess what? You're just going to get more. And Azure Pack is free. It plugs into Windows Server and System Center. 
So we are very committed to taking this forward, and the, and the things that you get in Azure, we're going to continue to trickle down those on over to the Azure pack as well. At the same time, to support all of these things, development. Visual Studio Online, we have over a million registered users already up in using Visual Studio up in Azure right now. We've got that already. We made huge announcements yesterday around what we're doing to make it easier to develop applications for any device to run anywhere. Mobility cloud, mobility cloud. That's very much our focus. Management. System center, system center. Oh, and by the way, we're making huge investments up in the public cloud with Intune and Advisor, as well as the ability to manage across clouds. Because just because I've deployed something here, I want to deploy workloads here and workloads here, I still want to manage those. I want to make sure I'm getting my service level agreement. Data. SQL Server has been released with rave reviews. Hecaton, 2000, SQL Server 2014. We're seeing performance improvements 30x. Crazy performance improvements because of the work that we've done in optimizing and, taking, uh, uh, and doing the inline memory work. It's huge. And guess what? We're making sure that it runs best on all of our clouds. It's optimized, it's tested from day one to run on Hyper-V, to run in Azure, to run in our clouds. Identity. Active Directory, honestly, we knew this was going to be popular up in Azure, but it is, I, it blows my mind how many people we're seeing uh, uh, authenticated. It's crazy, the numbers. I'll, get, I'll show you some numbers in just a moment. And then virtualization. And again, I'm going to be the first to tell you, as much as I've been focused and living and loving virtualization, I'm the first to tell you, it's not the end state. People will tell you, oh, you virtualized your apps, you're done. No, actually, you're not. People have finally figured out something. A few years ago when we released Azure, when we first launched Azure, Azure was PaaS only. A lot of people were scratching their head. They were trying to figure that out. Like, Microsoft, I don't get it. What are you doing? Why are you doing PaaS? Everybody else is off building IaaS and off building virtual machines. What are you doing? And it's because we actually knew what the end state looks like. The end state is not a virtual machine running in the cloud. Because once you take a VM to the cloud, okay, but I still have to manage it, I still have to monitor, I still have to patch it, I still have to do with all the life cycle of it. What people are realizing now is the end state is, oh, you really want to sassify your apps. Because then you can take advantage of all the benefits of cloud, elasticity, scale, and more. Guess what? We're already there. We've got PaaS and SaaS. And now the rest of the industry is going, hold it. We need to go build PaaS and SaaS. And we're going, been there, done that. So guess what? We've got a lot of investments here in the cloud OS. And the first point I want to make is, before I even get into the features and the little checkboxes that everybody wants to have that discussion about, and again, happy to have it whenever you want to, this is the bigger picture. This is the bigger picture. This is what you should be thinking about in terms of your cloud and your, and your journey forward. And for us, it's real simple. It's to provide the best cloud whenever and wherever it makes business sense. A couple things on Azure. 2013, crazy year. We talked, we talked about and released a whole bunch of features yesterday. Here's just some of the highlights of 2013. This isn't even a full list, but this shows you we are constantly releasing. Our cadence is crazy fast up in Azure. In fact, we have to purposefully slow things down because we could give you features every week and you could not keep, keep track. So we purposely slow down, package things up, and release biannually, sometimes quarterly, but we, we could go much faster. We purposely don't. You just could not keep up with all of those changes. As you're going in a footprint, just in a tremendous, tremendous way. Um, I've, you know, when things are going well, people see, you know, use the analogy, it's growing like you know, the hockey stick approach. Azure's growing like a flagpole. There's no hockey stick applied here. In 2010, we had as much compute and storage as the entire world did in 2000. Since then, we have doubled compute and storage every six months. That's how crazy fast Azure is growing. When it comes to the numbers, the numbers are huge. People say, you know what, I'll get to the cloud, but I don't know if my customer's there. Actually, your customers are there. Almost over 57% of the Fortune 500 are already using Azure. Yeah, it's, it's very real. It's very much happening. And it's, it's a constant drumbeat now. Over a uh, quarter of a million active websites, over a million SQL databases in Azure, 13, over 13 billion authentications in Azure Active Directory a week, and over a million developers registered with Visual Studio Online. 
We knew Azure Active Directory was going to be popular. I'll be honest with you, those numbers, those numbers are even big for me. That's, that's awesome. People are driving like crazy to Azure Active Directory. It's the canonical way to do identity now in the cloud. Really quickly, Sochi Olympics. I don't know if any of you watched it. Anybody? Anybody watch Sochi Olympics? It was huge at my house. I've got two daughters. My youngest one's a gymnast. Um, we, uh, we, we, we watched it and, and, and had a tremendous time. Um, I, uh, I, I enjoyed watching my, my daughters getting into it and uh, uh, grandma and grandpa, everybody around the TV watching. And one of the things that made me particularly happy was knowing, by the way, that we were powering the Sochi Olympics. We did all the live video encoding streaming. If you watch the Olympics anywhere, your phone, your iPad, your Surface, your iPod, your Android, your PC, your phone, your TV, you name it, guess where that was coming from? That was coming from Microsoft and NBC. We delivered all the streaming and coming, web and mobile, over 100 million viewers in 22 countries and four continents, more than 100 terabytes of storage, over half a trillion storage transactions, and we set a world record while we were doing it. During the Canadian-USA hockey match, people were logging in before the game, and as the game was going on and more and more people logging in, guess what? Azure just grew. Azure just grew. Over 2.1 million customers live streaming a sporting event, largest ever in the world ever. Guess what? When it was done, people started logging off, shrunk back down elastically. That's what you expect to do in the cloud world. And guess what? That's all powered by Azure and Hyper-V. Worldwide scale, planetary scale, done. All right. One other thing I want to point out. Big news, because I know we have international folks in, in the audience as well. Um, I was just at Tech Days in the Netherlands, and this came out while I was in the Netherlands, so I had a chance to talk to European customers, and honestly, they are thrilled out of their mind about this. Um, you guys will get these slides. They will be still publicly available. But the big deal here is Microsoft's enterprise cloud services, in particular Azure, Office 365, Dynamic CRM, and Windows in Tune, um, now have public approval by the EU. We are the only public cloud to have this approval. When I spoke to customers, I said, how do you feel about this? And customers thrilled out of their mind. They said, Jeff, we've been testing things on Office 365. We've been testing things in Azure VM. Everything we've seen is phenomenal. Technology-wise, we're there. We're ready to go right now. But from a business standpoint, there's a certain amount of risk that we just are not ready to entertain because in the EU, you've got to make sure that you've got this approval to work. We're very concerned. Privacy is a hot button item in the EU. Extremely hot button. So while we're ready, we've tested, we're ready to move tomorrow if we could. We're just not going to do it because we need, like, we need the green light. This is the green light. They said, this is exactly what I'm looking for. We're, we're gone. We are, we, are, we are ready to start making plans to move now immediately. Only public cloud approved by the EU. So we are very proud of this, and it's a, it was a huge amount of work, and our commitment is, is, is very much to continue to push and, uh, and push for our customers' privacy. You can read more in the blog here, and again, you guys will, will get the slides. Ecosystem updates, a number of things. Um, we have uh, our ecosystem around our private cloud is growing like mad. There's a couple things I wanted to point out. Um, Veeam has made some really nice uh, uh, capabilities and, 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 um, and, and products for Hyper-V for quite a while. Um, they're announcing they've got some new management packs for System Center, for monitoring, reporting, some new dashboards, some capacity planning to help you as you think about hybrid with Azure, because that's a question I get asked about, is, you know what, I've got stuff in my data center on premises, and I'd like to take advantage of Azure as an extension of my data center. I'd like to do some capacity planning. What tools are available? The Veeam guys have been working uh, to provide some really awesome things here. Some, they got some Hyper-V app to metal topology here in, in System Center Operations Manager. They've got some global dashboards, some new views, some new topologies that, uh, that uh, they've implemented. Uh, they've been doing things like this for quite a while. They have some new real-time um, compute and metrics that are being delivered through System Center Operations Manager as well. Um, here's the capacity planning I was talking about where they can look at your on-premises infrastructure and help you in determining what do I need uh, if I want to move this up to, uh, to Azure and much, much more. So I would highly recommend, if you're interested in more, taking, going by the Veeam booth, they're over at 1301, and uh, they can chat to you more about this. The other thing I wanted to point out is what our friends at 5.9 have been doing. 
Uh, 5.9 has actually been developing security products for plugging into our Hyper-V extensible switch now for, for some time. They've had many releases. It allows them to do all sorts of interesting things around intrusion detection and anti-malware. And I'd like to invite Konstantin Malkoff up here um, so he can give us a quick demo about some of the things they're doing in the, in the new release coming out um, that are very specific around cloud and multi-tenancy. So uh, would you mind uh, introducing, uh, giving a, a applause for Konstantin, please? Good morning, sir. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. All right, let's uh, switch you on over here. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Konstantin Malkov, CTO of Five9 Software. Uh, we have been developing management and uh, uh, security applications for specifically for uh, uh, Microsoft uh, 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 Windows Server and Hyper-V uh, for a few years. And uh, uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, security and compliance become more and more important uh, in modern world uh, due to various factors. Uh, of course, you know, the uh, size of the environments grow and uh, new regulations come in, uh, which uh, uh, cloud needs to enforce. Uh, this is one. Uh, secondly, uh, factorial growth, uh, or even probably more of uh, different types of malware, uh, uh, viruses that uh, attack uh, virtualized environments. So <clears throat> we have been uh, focusing on development uh, of the applications that come with uh, Windows Server and, and uh, uh, complements it to enforce security and compliance. And uh, uh, the theme of this session actually is uh, uh, if uh, somebody is still using VMWire, which had a wide, wide range of the uh, security applications and vendors uh, associated with it, uh, things such as uh, Altor Networks acquired by Juniper, Trend Micro, uh, uh, Kaspersky Virtualization Security, and a few others. Uh, that utilize so-called vShield API, uh, which used to be public and available to various uh, security vendors. Uh, and um, uh, as uh, you probably heard, they kind of took it in-house. Uh, so uh, what we have been doing is we have been utilizing very elegant architecture of uh, Microsoft uh, Hyper-V uh, extensible switch. And uh, I don't know if... Uh, so it's chopped uh, off a little bit on the top, but what you're seeing here is you're actually seeing that you're plugging into Right here, this is a, the, the virtual switch, the extensible, open extensible switch that we have right. to plug in your, your firewall, your virtual firewall extensions in here and your capturing extensions. Right, so uh, what I'm highlighting here is a uh, 5.9 filtering extension. Uh, that extension basically implements uh, two components uh, of our system, which is called the uh, 5.9 Cloud Security. Standalone version with the PowerShell API was released uh, uh, literally a couple of days ago. Uh, there's a public PR going out, and uh, uh, we are uh, proud to announce the beta of uh, version 4, uh, which supports uh, full multi-tenancy. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly show the uh, interface of the uh, application. Uh, does it, uh, so you yeah, can see yes, here you've yeah, got yes, firewall, you've right. got antivirus, and IDS. Right. Uh, there are three components. Uh, <coughs> uh, firewall, which allows to isolate virtual machines. You can create virtual machine security groups. Uh, it's extremely important in a private cloud uh, and, uh, you know, uh, enterprises that adopt um, uh, Windows Server and uh, Hyper-V um, uh, uh, cloud uh, 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 to implement their virtual private servers or virtual machines. Uh, you, you can uh, create security groups, so uh, different uh, virtual machines belonging to these security groups, they can see each other and not see each other. You, you could, in a very simple manner, uh, create uh, uh, different rules which uh, would allow you, uh, you know, certain types of traffic uh, for certain ports and uh, with uh, certain protocols. Uh, uh, I'm showing here actually uh, five nine. Uh, security plugin for uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Virtual Machine Manager. And um, for some reason, uh, yeah, it's a little slow here, but connection is slow. Uh, if you scroll down, you can see that uh, the plugin includes different types of menus uh, that plugin creates, and you could uh, set up certain virtual machines for monitoring. 
uh, same you could do uh, for the antivirus. You could uh, load the form uh, where you could uh, set the rules, as I mentioned. You could uh, review the firewall logs uh, for any particular virtual machines or group of virtual machines. There is an intrusion detection system. Uh, it's using the same filtering extension, same uh, uh, kernel mode driver that we developed. Uh, and uh, what it does, it does a deep packet analysis of uh, and, and uh, performs ma ma matching uh, of uh, uh, those packets with the uh, Cisco uh, Threatfire Snort signatures. So um, uh, you could see uh, uh, IDS logs. You could create uh, blocking rules uh, from certain IP uh, addresses, uh, IP ranges, and uh, so forth. Uh, there is also a unique module. Uh, which is uh, agentless antivirus. This is first and only a uh, full agentless implementation of uh, uh, antivirus. Uh, we now support three major engines, Viper, uh, uh, Sophos, and Kaspersky. And uh, uh, implementation is very unique because we have, we have developed a library that allows access to the virtual disk's uh, uh, file system. And uh, it works in conjunction with the change block tracking driver. So uh, incremental full scans are uh, very, very fast, uh, extremely fast. I mean, they literally go even for large size uh, virtual machines, virtual disks, uh, within seconds or minutes, not hours. Uh, and uh, because only change sectors are, are scanned. Uh, so you could see here an example uh, of uh, uh, such a kind of uh, antivirus scan. Uh, antivirus could be invoked on uh, schedule, on demand, uh, in any manner uh, you like. And uh, uh, I will briefly show the interface that allows you to create tenants, <clears throat> uh, which is extremely important for enterprises or hosting providers. Uh, uh, Multi-tenant environment, uh, we support uh, it uh, in the uh, uh, domain, uh, work group, and mixed. Uh, environments uh, right now, so you know I'm just going to briefly show how you could uh, add uh, the tenant. And uh, associate a specific set of virtual machines with it. And uh, then a uh, user, you could go uh, and uh, name the user, associate the password. And when you set the permissions, uh, obviously, you could um, pick the user that we just created. and. Uh, it could be security administrator, order, auditor. Uh, there are different types of uh, uh, users that could be created. And then uh, you could associate the tenant or group of tenants uh, with a specific user. So, uh, so, so multi-tenancy is one of the big new features that you're adding to version 4. That's um, right. In addition to intrusion detection and firewall securities that you've had in the previous versions that have been very popular with customers, um, now multi-tenancy gives you the ability to have um, you know, s secure isolation and be able to, to, to assign those policies to different uh, organizations and groups. So thank you very much, uh, 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 Konstantin. I've, I've got a tremendous amount of content, but I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I want to point out, if you guys would like to know more thank about you. what Five9 is doing, they've got a lot of videos. They've got more uh, information available online. And uh, Konstantin will be here afterwards to talk further about it. One of the things that we're, we're happy to see is that we continue to have more people plugging in and taking advantage of the extensibility that we've offered in Hyper-V. And a lot of those different ways to do that is through the open extensible switch that we created in Hyper-V. And 5.9 is one of those to do that. We are, there's plenty of others that are doing it. I'll talk about those as well, because it means that there, you get flexibility when you deploy your cloud solution. So let's talk about compute here. One of the things that we've been very focused on is, quite honestly, making sure you can run whatever workload you want to run in your private cloud. So scaling for mission-critical workloads is something we've been very focused on. And we've done that in, actually, we did this most of this, in fact, way back in 2012. So if you're looking at this going, hey, this actually doesn't look like it's changed for 2012 R2, 
you're correct. We released 2012, and honestly, after 2012, customers said, wow, that's really awesome. Um, I, I, I don't have any workloads that are pushing this at right now, um, so go focus on other things, which is exactly what we did. We support up to 320 logical processors, which is some of the biggest systems out there. That's a 16 socket server. Each socket has 10 cores, and then you enable symmetric multi-threading. It's a huge, huge box with support for up to four terabytes of physical memory for a host up to 1,024 VMs. And actually, the, bigger, the more important numbers are the cluster sizes. I get asked about this all the time. Jeff, I see you support 64 nodes and 8,000 VMs in a cluster. Why is that? Real simple. Service providers, customers, enterprises, government agencies, that's what they asked for. They said, we want to create scale-out distributed virtualization architecture, and the more nodes, the better because we want to be able to disperse all of the VMs across that. So that's why we focus on those big numbers. Support for up to 64 virtual procs and a terabyte of memory. I want to point out that's not just, that's a feature that's in Windows Server 2012 R2 standard and data center. You don't have to buy data center to get that. Unlike others, you know, if you, VMware, you've got to go buy Enterprise Super Special Plus Edition to get these types of features. This is actually in Windows Server 2012 standard enterprise. In fact, it's in Windows 8 client, in case you're wondering. Um, we, we don't think of scale as something you should be charging extra for. It's simply in the box. And because of that, we've been focused on making sure that these mission-critical workloads perform best. SQL Server 2012. As we went and scaled and added more virtual processors within a VM, what you're seeing is nearly perfect linear scalability. And that's because of hard work that we did optimizing every part of the stack storage, networking, compute, working with SQL, working with database, working with scale-up workloads, doing in-guest NUMA to make sure that you get this fantastic scalability. Exchange 2013, over 48,000 simulated users. And the point of this to show the scalability of Hyper-V itself. And even as we added all the way up to 48,000 users, notice that we still stayed below Exchange's requirement of, of, 20, of 20 milliseconds. Finally, SharePoint. Scaled to over 2 million heavy users at 1% concurrency across five VMs on a single Hyper-V host. Now, you may, may be wondering, hey, by the way, do you have any comparisons to the other guys? I'd love to. The other guys won't let me publish any numbers. There's a little EULA clause in VMware that says, sorry, we're not allowed to post any benchmarks. The important thing to understand is we're very much focused on making sure we have the best perf, period. I will also point out that if you look, VMware hasn't posted any performance numbers on anything modern for Hyper-V. Every performance benchmark I've ever seen for VMware always talks about Windows Server 2008 R2. That's five versions of Hyper-V ago. Why is that? Why aren't they talking about 2012 or 2012 R2? Could it be that they know that they're slower? Could it be that they know that they can't beat these numbers? I'll have to let you wonder aloud my, my, myself here. Um, we've been focused on also Third-party workloads, critical, key, scale-up workloads, SAP. The world record on a virtual machine is on Hyper-V. I'm super proud of this because the SAP team actually came to us with these numbers. This is SAP running their own SAP benchmarks, and this is doing this on standard two-socket servers. This is a three-tier common deployment of SAP using the standard servers everybody buys. This isn't some crazy scale-up workload that I went out and bought some 16-socket server to go run. This is the one that everybody runs. And guess what? It's 30% faster than the other guys. And they released the benchmarking numbers themselves. Really thrilled about that. Also, the work that we've done with Oracle. We shocked a lot of people last year when we were at Oracle Open World and we demoed Oracle Linux, Oracle DB, Oracle Java running on Azure and Hyper-V fully supported, license mobility, Java fully supported, and guess what? We even have those images sitting in the Azure gallery. You can go up to Azure right now and say, hey, you know what, I want Oracle Linux. I want Oracle DB. It's already sitting there waiting for you. So we've been working very much focused on those scale-up workloads. So these are the numbers that we've had actually since 2012. vSphere just caught up to us last year in 5.5, in most numbers. They're still behind us in cluster nodes. Still wait, uh, 64 nodes, 8,000 VMs, we still have that. And honestly, right now, you know, we can have the bragging rights, but at the end of the day, customers aren't saying, you know what, Jeff, I really need support for something bigger. Right now, the world has realized cloud is scale out. 
I'm not sure how much more scale up I need to do or how much more scale up even makes sense. Because if you're building a modern application today for cloud, spoiler alert, it's scale out. Scale up was how we used to do things. Scale up made sense 10, 20 years ago. Now we want to move to scale out because now I can really take advantage of cloud. Once I've actually scaled out, I can do all sorts of interesting things by inserting some load balancers in there. And I can get crazy performance improvements that I'm not going to be able to realize in traditional scale up. That's why a lot of people are attending, guess what, our cloud application development uh, sessions as well and how we're thinking about this going forward. Now, virtual machines are great for those legacy applications and workloads, but again, as you write those new next generation PaaS and SaaS apps, they're gonna be scale out. From a storage standpoint, we've been heavily focused on making sure that we can give you the best possible IO performance. Most of the time, Hyper-V is waiting. I get this question asked all the time, Jeff, do I buy the 2.4 gigahertz processors or the 2.8 gigahertz processors or the three gigahertz processors? And my answer most of the time is really I don't care. I'm gonna have cores coming out my ears, that difference in gigahertz is not that big a deal. What I really wanna know is how fast is the storage gonna actually be able to talk to me? Because most of the time Hyper-V is waiting. Because we've done a tremendous amount of work to optimize for storage. We have VM storage performance on par with native. We've done huge investments in here with the VHDX format, with work we've done in the storage stack. Performance scales linear with an increase in virtual processors. Back in server 2008 R2, a single VM could deliver ballpark about a quarter of a million 4K IOPS. That's still a really great number. That's nothing to sneeze at. 2012, we shocked the world. TechEd Europe, first time I demoed this publicly, over a million IOPS out of a single VM. No one had ever seen this before. People were like, holy cow, that's awesome. I went back to the team and I said, guys, this is really great. How are we going to top this? And the team said, well, we got some ideas. Literally a year later, TechEd Europe the next year went back, demonstrated over a million six, and this time 8K IOPS. Why 8K? Because that's what Exchange and SQL like. A 60% performance increase delivering twice the amount of IOPS. Wow. Awesome. That's what Hyper-V delivers. I don't know of anything in this range at all. When it comes to storage virtualization, we've made some huge investments in storage virtualization about increasing efficiency, lowering the cost, and taking advantage of the advancements in storage, particularly SSD. With storage spaces, what do we do? We take direct attached storage disks, we pool them, and once we pool them, those are created into spaces, which we then we, we present storage as volumes. And we like spaces a lot, because this is the work that we delivered in 2012, but in R2, we came back and said, oh no, we're putting in tiering. This allows us to truly embrace SSD. Because now we can move the hot blocks into the SSD, leave the cold blocks on the spinning disks, and you can take advantage of both. And the beauty of this is you could literally live migrate VMs from a 2012 private cloud to a 2012 R2 private cloud, do nothing at all, have the exact same hardware except have SSDs in there, and get a massive performance boost in your VMs just by live migrating to a newer cloud because we're taking advantage of storage tiering. So we have tiering. We also have a write-back cache. A write-back cache is great for those workloads that are spurious. Every so often you got a workload that's you know, 100 IOPS, and all of a sudden, boom, it needs 5,000 IOPS, and it goes back to 100. Now it needs oh, 2,000 IOPS. A write-back cache can absorb those, service the requester, and then write it through to the hard disk. So it's great for those spurious types of workloads. Finally, we have pinning. Pinning allows me to take those workloads. Guess what? I always need this thing to be fast. Put my database in there. Okay, guess what? We'll pin it into the SSD, and now it gets always ridiculous performance. And so we give you lots of flexibility around storage tiering and storage virtualization. And then finally, we made huge investments in the protocol itself. We like SMB3 a lot. Now, if you've used SMB historically, you go, well, hold it. SMB1 was slow, and SMB2 was a little better. You're totally right. SMB3, completely different. SMB3, I can smoke your fastest fiber channel. 
SMB3 is multi-tenant. I'm sorry, SMB3 is, is multi-channel. It's fault tolerant. It's encryption. We can do RDMA over it. There's a tremendous amount of capabilities built into it. Multi-channel. In the past, when you actually did a file copy with SMB1 and 2, we'd create a single channel, even on a 10 gig NIC, where we had a tremendous amount of headroom. Now with SMB3, we can create multiple channels and use up more of the pipe if we've got the headroom available. We can also use RDMA technologies, remote direct memory access, which allows us to offload a whole bunch of work, doesn't require any CPU utilization, and the performance is blindingly fast. SMB Direct means we can take advantage of things like Rocky, InfiniBand, 40 gigabits per second, 56 gigabits per second, way faster than Fiber Channel, and surprisingly very inexpensive, very, very cost competitive there. Transparent failover. SMB3 means I can literally walk up to a server, yank out a network cable, yank out a power cable out of one of the scale-out file servers, and the connections automatically get rerouted to another node. That's what cloud transparency is all about. I don't have to rewrite my apps. My apps don't even need to know anything about this. This is ideal for things like Hyper-V, ideal things for, for things like SQL. We can automatically load balance. As you add more nodes, we can load balance those connections as we add and as we remove, we can move those back in, all dynamically, all transparently. So it's a tremendous capabilities that we've added in SMB3, and it's why we like uh, SMB3 a lot, because guess what? It's over Ethernet. I get asked all the time, Jeff, what does this look like? Tell me what hardware is involved here. So I made a super simple diagram. Here I've got a Hyper-V compute cluster. I've got five servers. These are standard x86 servers running Hyper-V. I then connect via Ethernet. I don't need any fiber channel switches. I don't need any fiber channel HBAs. I don't have to deal with um, zoning, masking. These are, these are file shares. Easy. It also means I get fault tolerance, multi-channel, auto-scaling, encryption, and RDMA. I then connect via Ethernet to my scale-out file server. What is it? It's literally two servers. This is what software-defined storage is all about. It's taking mainstream hardware, hardware that we all have, not something special, not a special motherboard, not a special processor, not a special XYZ. This is an x86 server, except there are two of them because it's scale out. In this in example, I'm using Dell R720s, which then connect to my Dell MD1220s via SAS. This is serial attached SCSI. Now, there's my connections. Guess what? I've been running this, this is awesome, and you know what, I need to add more compute nodes. Okay, guess what? I plug in some more servers. Guess what? I scale out the compute layer. Oh, this is great. Now I want to add some more storage, though, because now I got more VMs. Guess what? I plug in some more JBODs. And it's all hot. This is all without downtime. I literally plug in some more storage. Guess what? Boom. There we go. Oh, well, you know what? I need some more compute again. OK, let's add some more. I need some more storage. Guess what? Let's plug in some more. Finally, if it ever happens, and it's really rare that it will, but if I really want to add more to the file server layer, I can even scale out the file server head on the fly. We love this architecture. There's a lot of tremendous goodness in here. I, and we can tell you why. You're running cloud scale, you're running Azure, you're running enterprises. There's a reason that you want these tiers to be separate. Because you want the flexibility to be able to scale each part of, uh, of this architecture independently. That is a capability you cannot overlook. If I need to add storage, if I need to add IOPS, if I need to add more capacity, I can do it without affecting my compute layer. And so we like this a lot. So when we think about um, another point, of the question I always get asked about is, in this post-Snowden world, I see this question being raised again. Jeff, I have good processes in place, but what other safeguards can I use to protect my data? OK. Well, here's a good example of this. Back in 2012, a large medical provider is paying over a million and a half to the US Department of Health and Human Services because 57 hard drives were stolen. They made the argument, look, we shouldn't have to pay anything because we did a whole bunch of security measures to protect this from even happening. It was secured by security patrols, biometric scanner, key card scanner, magnetic locks, key locks. Look, we did, a, you know, we did our, our due diligence. And you know what? I'm glad that they did their due diligence. 
U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, that said that was really nice, but guess what? The data got out. And we would find you more if we could. That's the maximum we're allowed by law. Because this is the most private information. Think about, I mean, I, I think about, you know, if this was my health data, even worse, I think about this, if this is my kids' data, I'd go completely crazy over that. You want to be able to protect this data. And a lot of times, it could be this. It could be the whoops moment. It could be the literally, you know what, we were recycling some hard drives and we thought we zeroed all the hard drives, but maybe we didn't. That's the thing that keeps CEOs in the up, up at night, is what, are, what is the accidental data leakage out there? How do we make sure that as new hardware comes in and the old hardware goes out, that we're not actually leaking something out the side? So that's why we think BitLocker drive encryption is key. This is in box. This is not something extra I have to buy. This is all part of the platform. It uses disk space encryption, integrates with the TPM. Guess what? It integrates with Active Directory. It integrates with Hyper-V. integrates with clustering, as you would expect all of this to just work. It supports multiple types. Traditional SANs, cluster shared volumes, the scale out file server. So there's tremendous capability here in the box and flexibility included. Well, let's take a look here. From a host iSCSI fiber channel, oh, not bad. Third party multipathing, yeah, we include that in the box. For VMware, you got to go buy the expensive version. You got to buy Enterprise, Enterprise Plus. Storage virtualization, we include in the box. Storage tiering, in the box. Data deduplication in the box, SMB3, 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 love SMB3, yep. Fantastic performance, phenomenal performance, and in fact, we're using SMB3 capabilities in other parts of the stack, like live migration, I'll talk about that in a moment, and physical disk encryption, all included in the box. Fiber channel. One of the other areas we focused on was providing a fantastic fiber channel experience inside the VM. There are a lot of ways you can architect this. There are some shortcuts you could use, or you could actually do the really hard, heavy lifting and actually make it look like you have a virtual fiber channel adapter in the VM. That's exactly what we did in Hyper-V. We released this, and customers honestly love this. Because guys that set up storage, that know how to manage their fiber channel arrays, their fiber channel sand fabric, that know how to zone and, 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 and mask and do all that stuff in their sleep, they want the VMs to act and configure like I would my physical machines. Keep that to be a consistent experience. What we did in Hyper-V was we provide fiber channel adapters in the VM. And what that means is things like guest clustering just work, MPIO, a critical multipath I.O. feature that you would absolutely do on hardware, you want to do that in a VM as well, guess what, that just works. Oh, and by the way, all of this works with live migration. As a core engineering tenant, we say that every feature has to work with live migration or it doesn't ship. I ask this question every time we go through a planning process for the next release. We'll talk with customers and I'll say, look, I've got shiny feature X here. If I give you shiny feature X, by the way, this VM is locked to this piece of hardware. I can't live migrate it, I can't storage migrate it, I cannot move it, I cannot cluster it, I cannot fail it over, it is locked here. How do you feel about this feature? And the answer is always the same. Oh, I don't even want this feature. I don't, don't even talk about this feature. Go bury this thing out back. Live migration is how I do business. I need this for load balancing. I need this for, um, for unplanned downtime, for planned downtime. There's no way you're taking that feature away now. That is table stakes. So every feature we release, like the hard ones, like virtual fiber channel and other ones, all work with live migration. And trust me, it's, it's not always easy to make all of these things work, but we make sure we do it the right way every time. So up to four fiber channel adapters within a VM, supports multi-path I.O., supports guest clustering, supports live migration. Guest clustering. We've also made sure that from a guest clustering standpoint, we provide a rich set of features and capabilities. Whether you want to do it over fiber channel, whether you want to do it over iSCSI, whether you want to do it over SMB-based storage, all of these work. And they don't come with five pages of disclaimers. So if I want to set up guest clustering, and the reason why I want to do this is because guess what? I want that application that I'm delivering to be highly available. 
And by the way, I want to be able to move it to and from clouds. How do I do that? It means I want to be able to deliver HA. Well, there's some work that we've done there as well. I'll get to that in just a second. But guest clustering, key capability, all just works. So what does that mean for us? You want a maximum guest cluster size? You want 64 nodes? Go for it. Whether it's iSCSI, fiber, file-based. Guest clustering with live migration? Yeah, absolutely. Guest clustering with dynamic memory? Absolutely. We don't take any shortcuts here. We make sure all of the features work. We make sure we test these, and we make sure that they work, and we're not going to give you some arbitrary restrictions. vSphere says, nope, you get five. In certain configurations, you only get three nodes in a guest cluster. And that doesn't matter whether it's iSCSI, fiber, or fiber channel. If you want to use memory overcommit, sorry, that doesn't work with guest clustering. They tell you to turn that off. No, no. People expect to be able to use things like dynamic memory, which is why we make sure that it's all part and parcel of our package. It's all built in. From the standpoint of clustering, one of the challenges that we've seen is moving a cluster to the cloud. Customers have told us, look, I want to build an application, and my applications commonly use M uh, Microsoft clustering services, but if I want to take that to a cloud, I can't necessarily do that. And let me explain why. Here's the, some of the challenges of guest clustering. You've got the cloud infrastructure on the bottom. That's managed by your IT pros, your admins. And above that, you've got your tenants. They're running their VMs, their services. Now, up above the red line, I get a VM. I have, I have virtual processors. I have virtual storage. I have virtual networking. I don't know where that server actually resides. I don't know what type of storage I live on. Maybe it's iSCSI. Maybe it's a file share. Maybe it's a SAN. I don't know. All that I know is I've been giving some type of storage or some type of SLA. Below that red line, these guys care about the hardware. And they want the ability to change out and add different storage or change out and add more server nodes or replace things that go bad or do things on the fly. But the important point is this red line. You see, the red line means that, you know what, what's happening above and what's happening below, we want those to maintain separated. OK? And here's why this is a challenge for guest clustering. So customers demand HA. I mean, honestly, who's deploying applications out today that don't have HA? You're not going to have a job for very long. So infrastructures care about what's below the red line. They're focused on uptime, agility, and performance. The guest clustering, though, changes this. Because guest clustering requires that I poke a hole through that. Guest clustering says, oh, I need to see an iSCSI LUN or a fiber channel LUN so that I can actually see the shared storage. I need to set this up for multiple VMs. This is not an easy problem to solve. We spent a lot of time looking at this, and it's why we delivered shared VHDX virtual disks. Shared VHD virtual disks are virtual disks that can be shared without presenting real LUNs to tenants. And the beauty of this is it gives you guest clustering, it eases operations and management, and that shared disk lives above the red line. This is something that now service providers, enterprises, can do with confidence. Because guess what? In that other one, where you have to poke a hole through the red line, service providers won't do it. There's no way on earth I want you seeing the actual physical hardware, which means you can't take the cluster to the cloud. Now you can. Because it lives above the red line, and from within the virtual machine, it appears as shared SaaS. So guess what? All of your workloads just work. SQL? Oh, yeah, it's just, just SaaS. Just works. And so guest clustering with shared VHDX also works on any type of storage. Very flexible. Works on block storage. Works on iSCSI. Works on fiber channel. Oh, yes, and it works on our scale-out file server as well. Tremendous flexibility there. So now I have that ability to deliver guest clustering in a cloud environment. Virtual fiber channel support. Yes, we have it. And not only do we have it, we did it the right way. Ours appears as a real virtual fiber channel within the VM. Virtual fiber channel MPIO support. Because of the fact that we did the hard work to enable this as a true virtual fiber channel HBA within the VM, you can do MPIO. The other guys took shortcuts. So you can't do MPIO. Sorry, that doesn't work in the guest. We support 4K drives, maximum virtual hard disk size, maximum pass-through disk size. Yeah, we support some crazy disk-through sizes. It actually says 256 terabytes, but for us, there actually is no limit. The limit is actually what is supported in the guest OS. 
For most people, 64 terabytes in a virtual hard disk is plenty. I should also point out that we support up to 255 virtual disks per VM. So that's 64 terabytes, that's a single disk, and we support up to 255 of those. So if you do the math, it's roughly 16 petabytes per VM. So you're going to run out of physical storage long before you run out of virtual storage. Um, online virtual disk resize. Love this feature. Because now you can not only grow virtual disks, but you can shrink virtual disks on the fly. So say, for example, you had a, a virtual disk and it was running, and you know what? You, you increased it from 60 gigabytes to 250 gigabytes. And you realize, whoops, that was too big. I should have just made it you know, 150. Guess what? You can shrink it down all, all of this live while the VM is running without any downtime. And we are the only platform with guest clustering with shared virtual disk for production use. I know that VMware has got some shared virtual disks, but it means you run it on the same server, which defeats the whole purpose of clustering, because that's not actually HA at all. Server goes down, you just lost everything. This is a true, true solution for guest clustering. From a VM mobility standpoint, one of the things that we continue to do is keep our foot down on the gas pedal. One thing you've told us is you really like live migration, you love the enhancements that we've done, and you've told us to keep pushing. In fact, 2012, we were the first hypervisor to deliver shared nothing migration. The ability to live migrate a VM with nothing but a network connection. I've done it over Ethernet cables. One of my, one of my colleagues, Ben Armstrong, <laughs> worked with the guy forever. He actually likes to do that demo over wireless. The live migrate VMs between two laptops using wireless. It's pretty awesome. So we've got every type of migration known to man. You want to live migrate with HA. You want to live migrate using uh, over SMB. You want to live storage migrate. You want to use shared nothing. It's all there. One of the other things we want to do is we want to future-proof your investment. So we made sure that when we delivered live migration, we scale to any type of hardware. What do I mean by that? It means we'll scale to your investment in hardware. If I've got two gigabit NICs, I've got two servers gigabit, I can probably live migrate two to four simultaneously. If I've got dual, gig, dual gigabit, I can probably do four to eight. If I've got 10 gigabit, single 10 gigabit, I can probably do 10 to 20 live migration simultaneously. If I've got dual 10 gig, gigabit teamed, I can probably do anywhere between 20 to 40 live migration simultaneously. If I've got quad teamed live, uh, quad team 10 gigabit NICs, we've actually done over 200 virtual machines live migrated simultaneously. Here's two 10 gigabit NICs. Very common scenario these days for, for modern servers. Two 10, 10 gig NICs teamed using Windows Server built-in NIC teaming. And guess what? Here you're seeing 40 VMs being live migrated simultaneously. The point is, we'll scale to whatever hardware you have. Hyper-V doesn't have an inherent limitation. You want, you want to do more? Great. Add some more hardware. Add some more NICs, add some more switches, whatever. But you give us more hardware, we'll continue to push the, the envelope even further. That's 40 live migrations going on. In 2012 R2, we kept the foot down on the gas pedal. And we said, no, we're, got, we're not done yet. We got more to do. We wanted to make it even faster. So we introduced live migration with compression. With compression, we're taking advantage of the fact that servers ship with lots of cores in them, lots of threads in them, and guess what? Most of the time, we've got cores coming out of our ears. So you know what? We use a little bit of that CPU and apply some compression, and it's intelligent compression. So if the server's really busy, if it's really maxed out, then we'll use light and maybe no compression. But if there's not much happening, guess what? We can be more aggr aggressive about the compression, so it's dynamically an intelligent algorithm for compression. What it means, though, is during the live migration, we'll take some of that CPU, we'll compress the VM in line during live migration so there's less to transfer. It means live migration is faster. And you'll note on the slide here it says 2x performance improvement. I'll be honest with you, that number is very super conservative. That's the number the attorney makes me put up there. Um, because guess what? Yeah, 2x, OK. Uh, it depends on your workloads. If you've got lightly loaded servers that aren't doing much, I've seen this anywhere between 3x to 8x. Easy. And the beauty of this, this just works with any server you have today. Because all it's using is a little bit more compute. OK? This is the new default for 2012 R2. So I said, guys, this is awesome. Are we done? And they said, actually, we've got one more thing we want to show you. 
We want to take the learnings that the, the scale out file server team did with SMB and RDMA. And we want to apply those to live migration as well. So that's why we introduced live migration over SMB. Now you're talking about blistering, face melting performance. Okay? You're talking about the fastest live migrations on any platform, period. We take advantage of SMB multi channel. So if you have multiple NICs in there, guess what? We'll take advantage of that to go faster. Because we're using RDMA, the beauty of that is there's no CPU utilization. So guess what? I can have fully loaded servers running at the max, and guess what? It doesn't add any additional load on it. So that's beautiful. Because we're supporting RDMA over SMB Direct, we can use InfiniBand. We can use Rocky. We can use iWarp. With InfiniBand, we can go all the way up to 56 gigabits per second. Blinding performance. Delivers the highest performance for live migration. So what do those numbers look like? Oh, by the way, the question I always get asked is, Jeff, why isn't this the default then if it's so fast? Because this requires specific hardware. This requires that you have RDMA-capable NICs. And I'll be super honest with you, if you're looking at buying some new hardware, something you should ask your OEMs, ask your vendors. Say, hey, do you have RDMA in there yet? We've been super loud. They know that we love RDMA a lot because the performance is breathtaking. There's no CPU utilization, and we can do a lot with that. So in the real world, what does that mean in terms of real benefit at scale? Well, we ran a test, and we ran a very very real world test. In fact, we used the worst possible scenario. This is the worst possible scenario for any type of live migration. We have SQL Server running in a VM. The VM has eight gigs of memory, and we're running an OLTP workload. And the reason why this is the worst possible scenario is because the memory in this thing is constantly churning. So whether you're doing live migration, vMotion, whatever, we have to track those pages, we have to monitor those pages, and as they change those dirty pages, we have to monitor those and make those changes as they happen. So this is the worst possible scenario for any VM migration. We then tested live migrating between server 2012 to server 2012. Took a minute, 25 seconds. Not bad. 2012 R2 with compression, the new default, we got this down to 32 seconds. We then said, hey, what happens with SMB Direct? Oh, by the way, got it down to 10 seconds. By the way, this isn't the RTM numbers. When I actually did this on the RTM bits, we got this down to nine seconds. Now, you may be going, well, Jeff, that's, that's pretty cool, but honestly, you know, th that's kind of cool for a single VM, but, you know, what, what, what's the big benefit? Well, the big benefit is when you start to talk, think about this at scale. We need to patch a host cluster. And by the way, whether you're patching VMware, Zen, Hyper-V, the scenario is the same. So you have an eight-node cluster. And each node has 256 gigs of memory. I picked these because these are common, that's a common configuration. So you're running a whole bunch of VMs, and you need to actually patch the host cluster. Maybe it's a firmware update. Maybe you want to add memory, want to change out storage, whatever. So what's the process? The process is you drain all the VMs off node one. You put it into maintenance mode so VMs can't be migrated onto it. You take it offline. You do whatever maintenance you need to do. If you need to reboot it, you reboot it. Then you move the VMs back over, and you go to node two, and you walk through every node in the cluster, and then rinse and repeat. OK? That's pretty, pretty straightforward. And by the way, if this is server 2012 or server 2012 R2, this is an automated process. You actually can just hit the go patch the cluster now button and watch this happen. You can even schedule this. Say, you know what? I want this to just patch the host cluster at the end of the month. A lot of people don't realize this feature's been in for two releases already. It is sweet. So make sure if you're not already thinking about this, you should be looking at cluster-aware updating, all part of the package. So if I needed to patch this in 2012, ballpark about eight hours. And again, I'm using the worst case numbers, the SQL numbers, assuming every VM is running completely at max, worst case scenario, all running OLTP workloads. 2012 R2 with compression, about four hours. With RDMA, guess what? I can do this over my lunch break. And the beauty of this is, even though you can do this automated, you're still going to have somebody there watching it. Okay? Maybe you're doing some email, maybe you're doing other things, but you're still going to have someone that's watching it, making sure that everything completes okay. Well, that's great for a single eight-node cluster. But now let's start talking scale. Okay? If you start to think, hey, you know what? I have 50 eight-node clusters. Then you start talking about two months. You start talking about eight weeks. 
actually I did the math on this, and, the, and, and if you did 58 node clusters with 2012, it takes 11 weeks. If you do it with compression, it takes five weeks. And if you do it with RDMA, it takes one week and a couple of hours. So now you're talking major, major tangible benefits from an operation standpoint. So from a Hyper-V standpoint, live migration, we're not done. We're going to keep our foot down on the gas pedal. VM live migration, yep. Live migration compression, yep. RDMA, yep. Live migrations, we have no limit. The limit is only how much hardware do you want to bring to the party. All right? Live storage migration, shared nothing live migration, live migration upgrades, yep. All part and parcel in the package. Networking. We've done a tremendous amount of work in the switch itself. The Hyper-V extensible switch is, a, is an area that we've done a lot of innovation because we want and understand there's a tremendous amount of value in the extensible switch. And honestly, when it came to the switch, we, we could have architected in a number of ways. Okay? You know, we basically said, look, when it comes to the switch, we could have made it replaceable. Replaceable means, hey, I'm going to take out the existing one and I'm going to drop in something else. So, for example, I'm using the, the vSphere switch or I drop in a Cisco switch and it's replaceable. Or we could have gone something a little bit different, which is make it open and extensible, which is what we did. And the reason why is because there's a lot of value in the switch path itself that we want to provide, but we also know that we want to provide partners, partners the ability to plug in there as well. And so we've added a lot of features into the switch itself, things like uh, um, uh, network um, bandwidth, uh, bandwidth uh, capabilities in there, qual quality of services in there, mins and maxes in there. We put in security features that are actually built into the Hyper-V switch, like DHCP guard, router guard. We've done things um, around performance. We'll get to in just a minute for SRIOV. But the point of the extensible switch is that partners can easily plug into it. And in, from an inbox standpoint, it's very rich. Like I mentioned before, DHCP guard. We have um, spoofing protection, MAC guard in there. We've got virtual port ACLs, trunk mode, PV LANs, VLANs. Everything, by the way, can be configured via PowerShell or WMI. So, you know, if you want to easily set up a couple of PowerShell scripts to create, um, to, to create and deploy switches over a lar large amount of machines, you can do that. You can do it through System Center. Tremendous amount of flexibility there. When we developed the extensible switch, we actually have three different areas you can plug in. In the capture extensions, if I just want to see packets as they go across the switch, we have great partners like, for example, Inmon has S-Flow. So you can just plug in right into the capture extensions. If I want to do filtering extensions, for example, I want to do firewall, I want to do in intrusion detection, I want to do IPS, I want to do anti-malware, like in 5.9s, for example. Guess where they're plugging in? They're plugging in the filtering extensions. What if I want to use forwarding extensions? For example, I want to use the Cisco Nexus 1000V. Or maybe I'm interested in OpenFlow. Well, guess what? NEC has a programmable OpenFlow switch that also plugs into Hyper-V. The Cisco switch and the OpenFlow switch both plug into forwarding extensions. On top of all of this, you can use these in tandem. So for example, I could have the S-Flow running here in the capture extension, and I could have the Cisco running down here in the forwarding extension. Or I could be in a branch office and say, you know, you know what, in my branch office, I want to set up 5.9 here to do my intrusion detection in my firewall. So there's a lot of flexibility. And guess what? You may decide, you know what, this looks great, Jeff, but I have some weird, wacky networking requirement that nobody else cares about, and I don't see a product there. Well, guess what? You could write your own networking extension. You see, the extensible switch is also built into Hyper-V on client. So on your laptop, you could develop, write your own switch extension on client and deploy it on server, because it's the same. So it makes it really easy for folks that are interested in that level of development and being able to plug into the switch ability to do that. And like I mentioned, we've got lots of partners here, and there are many more coming. So when it comes to the extensible switch, ours is open, ours is extensible. APIs publicly available, and yes, we have part numerous partners there. Private VLANs, ARP, um, ND protection, DHCP snooping, virtual port ACLs. These are all things that are built in. I don't need to buy an extra. I don't need to buy something optional. I don't need, these are all built in to the product. Trunk mode, port mirroring, port monitoring. 
It's all there. It's all there. Then we get to this one, SRIOV. So one of the points I made earlier is we will not release a feature unless it works with live migration. This is a perfect example of something that's incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. So going back to one of my first points was mission critical workloads. One of the things we want to make sure is that we can run any workload you need in a VM. And I've got, for example, people to tell me, look, I got this big old monster database. I got some Oracle, I got some SAP, I got some SQL. And you know what's running on big, big iron. And you know what? I really want to move this into a VM. And the reason why is simple. This hardware that I've had for quite a while, it's not going to last forever. And because it's stuck to this thing, I can't upgrade it. If I move it to a VM, now it's movable. It's migratable. I can take advantage of all the advantages of, 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 of virtualization, and I can upgrade it to new hardware just by moving the VM to faster hardware. But here's the thing. This thing, this scale-up workload running on this physical iron has two 10 gigabit NICs in it, teamed. And the reason why is because I need 20 gigabit into this workload. How do I do this in a VM? Oh, and by the way, I, this has to work, of course, with live migration, because that's one of the reasons I'm doing this, to give me that flexibility. The way you do that is through single root I.O. virtualization, SRIOV. With SRIOV, you're taking a physical NIC, and you're actually kind of cutting it into two pieces. There's the control plane and the data plane. The control plane is how you manage the NIC, and the data plane is where the bits actually traverse and get to the wire. The beauty of this is this. With SRIOV, the NIC actually appears in the VM. You go into Device Manager and it says, oh, this is an Intel NIC, or a Broadcom NIC, or a Chelsea NIC. It actually sees the physical hardware, which means when I go to actually do network performance, I'm getting true 10 gigabits in and out of that, that physical NIC. It's not going through the virtual switch. It's going directly to the wire, which means now I can team two of those, and guess what? I have 20 gigabits into my VM. Awesome. Guess what? Making this work with live migration, brutally difficult because we have to handle all sorts of interesting scenarios. We have to handle the scenario of, you know what, I need to be able to live migrate this to another system, and maybe that other system has, an, has SRIOV NICs, but it's out of SRIOV resources, okay? Or maybe I need to migrate this to a host because I'm having an urgent issue, and guess what, the only host I have available doesn't have SRIOV NICs, but I still expect to live migrate it, and I still expect it to work. I'm, I'm willing to take a drop in performance, but I still need the uptime. We handle all of those scenarios. So SRIOV gives you the best of all worlds with Hyper-V. Super crazy awesome performance. You need greater than 10 gigabits into a VM, this is how you do it. You also get live migration. We make sure that we map the functions over, we actually make sure that when we move to a new server, we'll set up SRIOV there. In the case where it doesn't exist, we will still make sure that we live migrate the VM over because we know it could be a transient, uh, uh, transient until you get it to a new system that has SRIOV on it, but we will do the right thing and make sure that the VM always continues to run because at the end of the day, that is why you're taking advantage of live migration. We made sure that all of these things just work. VMQ, IPSec, task offload, by the way, for encryption. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, what about end-to-end -end encryption on the wire? We support IPSec, so if your NIC supports hardware-based encryption offloads on the NIC, we'll use it by default. SROV with live migration, virtual receive side scaling, all there. Network virtualization. Network virtualization, one of the hottest topics. I get this question asked all the time. This seems really super clear, cool. Everybody keeps telling me that network virtualization is the greatest thing ever. My children will be happier. My car will get better gas mileage. This thing will be just magical. But no one can explain to me why this is important. Why do I care? Well, network virtualization and software-defined networking is important because you need the ability the agility to move your workloads and services wherever and whenever it makes business sense. Remember when I started off this, 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 this session and I had the three clouds, private, public, and service provider. If I build something on my private and decide I want to move it to public or to service provider, how are you going to do that? 
Do you think you can just magically take a service and move it from one location to another and it's just going to magically work without changing any network settings at all? Really? No, that's not going to work. What you really want to be able to do is you want to be able to decouple the applications and their logical networks from their physical networks so that I can do the right thing for my apps and services. So network virtualization is about agility. It's about flexibility. And of course, it's about maintaining isolation. So you get logical segmentation through network virtualization. I don't have the limits of VLANs. VLANs were a great solution back in you know, 1995. They don't work at cloud scale. But what it means is I can have Coke and Pepsi, blue and red network, blue and red companies with the same exact IP addresses residing on the same hosts, and they still can't see each other. They're completely logically segmented. By the way, that's how we run Azure. I get, you know, you do realize that humans don't make our changes in Azure. You know, we'll make up to 50,000 network changes a day in Azure. Humans do not make those changes. One, you know, typo mistake, guess what? We just had a catastrophic problem here. No, what you do is you set this up, you assign it via policy, you let the network figure it out. Okay? That's what network virtualization is all about. This is too complex for humans to figure this out on their own. So, network virtualization is something, honestly, Hyper-V network virtualization is something we've had in the box now for two releases. And I get this asked all the time, Jeff. You know, with, with VMware, I think I need a, there's, there's, there's a VXLAN, there's also a NICERA. I'm not entirely sure what I need, but what do I need from Microsoft? It's real simple. It's Windows Server and System Center. That's it. I've had people ask me point blank, is there a Windows Server SDN edition? No, it's Windows Server. Network virtualization is already built in, already done. By the way, we made it even better in 2012 R2 with the network virtualization gateway. This allows your virtualized network traffic to speak to your physical fabric as well. What about VMware? Honestly, uh, do I use VXLAN? Do I use NSX? How much does this cost? One of the things I'm asked is, is there an additional charge for network virtualization? Do you charge me for each VM? No. It's all built in. It's all part of it. Use as much network virtualization as you want. We'll make more. There's no per VM charge. We don't do VTAXs around here. So the undeniable best hypervisor for Microsoft workloads, period. You talk to anybody in Microsoft. You talk to Dynamics. You talk to SharePoint. You talk to SQL. You talk to Exchange. They will tell you the same thing. Run it on Hyper-V. It's the most tested platform. Within just the cloud and enterprise division alone, just my division alone, we, we have 30, about 35,000 VMs spin up a day to run unit tests. Okay? At the end of the day, guess what? Any issues, we pull those VMs out so we can look at them later. Next day, we shut, we, 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 we tear the, all, the, all the ones that pass, we tear down, we start up again. So on a, on a monthly basis, easily half a million plus tests all running in cloud enterprise on Hyper-V. It's part of our common engineering criteria. Literally everybody at Microsoft is testing on Hyper-V and Hyper-V alone. We integrate all of our technologies with each other. You want to do single sign-on? Guess what? It just works with Hyper-V. You want to use BitLocker? You want to use guest clustering? It all just works. We make sure of that because we're testing this out of the box. All of these teams recommend it. Azure is powered by Hyper-V. Oh, and by, by the way, one more thing, and I know I'm out of time, but we don't ship with insecure Easter eggs in our products, by the way. If you're interested in Pong in your cloud solution, then guess what? Maybe, maybe you do want to go with VMware. Um, if you're interested in making sure, though, that people aren't running and providing, putting hidden little Easter eggs in your code because they think that's cute, that's not what we do at Microsoft. This is fireable offense. This is, you don't have a job anymore. Okay? This is shipped in multiple versions of vSphere, and I'm guessing that when VMware went through the common criteria certification with the uh, security vendors and their security evaluation, they didn't happen to mention this. So we don't do this. This just, sorry, this was, you know, cute back in the 80s. <laughs> we don't do this anymore. You shouldn't be doing this. We don't do that. So. Couple things to point out. We're leading the industry. A number of industry first. 
First hypervisor with shared nothing live migration. First hypervisor with built-in replication. First virtualization platform with network virtualization built in. First network virtualization with built-in storage virtualization. First virtualization with built-in SMB3 awesome native support. First and only virtualization platform with built-in storage encryption. And then there are places we're still, we are just simply straight out leading, where the other folks still haven't caught up to us. vSphere 5.5, I get this asked, question asked all the time, have they caught up? No, they still haven't. In fact, vSphere 5.5 is just catching up to what we delivered in Windows Server 2012 almost two years ago. They haven't caught up to anything that we're, you know, the things that we're doing in 2012 are too. And by the way, the, our foot's still down on the gas pedal. And one of the reasons why is because of the Cloud OS vision. Let me say this again. We can have the checkbox where, to we're all blue in the face. Please don't. Look at this. Understand how we think about the cloud. It's a very holistic view. And the benefit of this is simple. We're driving a tremendous amount of innovation in Azure. And guess what? Those features in Azure go into Windows Server, because guess what? Azure is using Windows Server. So Azure puts those features into Windows Server. Windows Server puts features that go into Azure. We're on this incredibly fast, what we call virtuous cycle, something that Satya was very proud of that we, we were doing in Cloud and Enterprise before he took the CEO position. So again, thank you very much. Uh, we are focused on a holistic cloud strategy that provides our valued customers the best cloud for whenever and wherever it makes business sense. I'll be up here answering any questions. Thank you guys very, very much, and enjoy the rest of the week here at TechEd. OS, and the reason why is really simple. Um, I know we can have the checkbox war. Um, honestly, I've been, like I said, I've been at Microsoft for 11 years, and I've been having the checkbox war. And the checkbox war is literally, folks like to bring in a laundry list of checkboxes from other companies and basically say, look, here are all the features that are super, super duper important. Most of the time, it's a small subset of those features, but they have to put all of the checkboxes on there so we can have this little checkbox discussion. I'm ready to tell you I'm ready to have the checkbox discussion whenever you want, okay? Honestly, I got more checkboxes than anybody has, but honestly, that's to me, is like a 10-year-old discussion. Um, what you really want to be asking yourself is this. Where do I want to be next year, five years, 10 years? Where do I want to be as a business? Where do I want to be as an IT professional? Is it still having the checkbox war? Don't think so. It's much bigger than that. Um, and it starts with how we think about the cloud and how we think about the cloud OS. At Microsoft, the cloud, it's really simple to me. It's very straightforward. And I always start off with this because I want people to be crystal clear with how we think about the cloud OS. We think of it as three legs to a stool. Okay? It starts with the private cloud. And the private cloud is Windows Server and System Center. And I always talk about them both. Because everyone likes to focus on the hypervisor. Don't get me wrong, I love hypervisors. They're awesome. It's what I've been doing for a good portion of my career. Love it. They're awesome. But if you're not actually managing this, you're missing the bigger picture. Okay? Platform is Windows Server, but System Center is not only how you manage. Are we on? Yes, now I can hear myself. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. It must be uh, time on the dot. Thank you very much for being here. This is DCIM. B379. My name is Jeff Wolsey. I'm a principal program manager in the Microsoft Cloud and Enterprise division. I've had the pleasure of working on hypervisors and virtualization now for the last 17 years, 11 of it at Microsoft. Before then, I was at a small startup in California doing virtualization um, long before most people knew what it even was. Uh, way back when, it was a science project. Um, and it was interesting, way back when people wanted to run things like DOS and Windows 3.1 on their Apple Power Mac 6100, 7100, and 8100. So not only did we do virtualization way back when, but we actually did binary translation from x86 to PowerPC and back, which is actually far more difficult than just straight up virtualization. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be honest with you. I got about 20 hours of content that I'm going to try and squeeze into 75 minutes. Um, I haven't done this session in quite a while, and I was asked, I was like, hey, Jeff, you, we should probably do a, an update on where we are these days uh, in 2012 and 2012 R2 because there's so many changes. And one of the things I've heard from customers and, and talking with customers, honestly, is they've had a hard time keeping track of all of the changes because there's been a flurry of, of work that we've been doing in terms of uh, cloud, uh, private cloud, and all of our cloud OS vision. 
I'm going to talk briefly about the cloud OS. I want to do, spend a quick moment on ecosystem updates, and we are going to power right on through software-defined compute, software-defined storage, software-defined networking, and more. Um, the first thing I do, I do want to do is start with cloud. Planet-wide services, full stop. Brad mentioned this yesterday. There are three companies delivering at that scale. Three. Us, AWS, and Google. Spoiler alert, none of them use VMware. Two of them use hypervisors that you can't get. You can't get Google's hypervisor. They don't provide it to you. They've done custom stuff on open source work, and how much have they given back to anybody else? None of that. AWS, same spot. Azure, and what we deliver in the public cloud, is Hyper-V. It's what we give you. It's actually based on Windows Server 2012. We haven't even gone up to R2 yet. Trust me, they're working on it. But guess what? That's Hyper-V. We call it Azure. We don't call it Windows Server in the cloud because we deliver it as a finished service. We deliver PaaS, SaaS, and IaaS. Okay? We deliver virtual machines. We give you finished services. That's why it's called Azure. It's not called Windows Server in the cloud. We also have service providers. And service providers give us customization and reach. Just yesterday, I spoke to a customer who asked me this exact question. Jeff, I have a specific workload. I would like to put in a specific server in a specific rack uh, in a specific location. Can I do that with Azure? And unfortunately, that's not how we work at Azure scale. At hyperscale, at cloud scale, we are buying in Azure literally servers at thousands at a time. A rack is tiny. We don't even think in those terms. We can't deploy in those terms. We're literally doing deploy, lifecycle manage your cloud infrastructure, but it's about those applications. If you're running SQL, if you're running Exchange, if you're running SharePoint, if you're running Dynamics, if you're running Link, best, guess what? The best way to manage those is with System Center because those teams, SQL, write the management packs that go into System Center. Not some random team, the team that actually develops those applications and workloads. There is no team that knows better how to manage and monitor those workloads. Okay? So it's very straightforward. When I think about the private cloud, I can easily describe it in one word, and that one word is control. I'll talk with customers. I was literally in Europe a few weeks ago for tech days in the Netherlands, and I spoke to a customer who says, Jeff, I've got a workload that has to run in a German data center by a German citizen on German soil. Are you going to try and argue with me and say that I need to push this up to Azure? And my answer is absolutely not. This is not a technology discussion at all. This is a data sovereignty. This is a compliance. This is a regulatory reason. It doesn't make business sense. So I'm not going to push you to that. Let's help you build the best private cloud together. That's Windows Server and System Center. At the same time, we've been very open and upfront with everybody. We are making huge investments in the public cloud. Keynote was a perfect example of that. I mean, literally yesterday, it was feature after feature that was hybrid cloud after hybrid cloud after hybrid cloud. And guess what? That's just building on all of these things we've been doing in hybrid cloud. We are clearly leading in this area. And when it comes to public cloud, the public cloud I can describe in one word. That's scale. What we are delivering in Azure today is thousands of servers at a time. So if you want to say, hey, I need that specific thing, guess what? We have a cloud OS network of service providers that are happy to do that around the world. They can give you that customization and reach. The reason why this is so important is because when we think about the cloud, it's this whole thing. Folks will tell you, some folks will tell you, cloud is private cloud. It's running it on your premises. We'll sell you software, you run this, you set up your private cloud, that's cloud. Other folks will say, no, that's not cloud. If you talk to Amazon, Amazon will say, no, it's running virtual machines up in an Amazon cloud. If you talk to Salesforce, Salesforce will say, that's not cloud. Salesforce will say SaaS. They'll say running software as a service up in the cloud is cloud. And we say, that's all nice, but you're thinking about it in these very narrow terms. And I understand why. It's because you don't want to actually face the big picture here, which is when you think of cloud, it's all of the above. It's public, it's private, it's service providers, it's all three. And when customers ask me, I get this question all the time, Jeff, in five years, where are we going to be? Is it all public? Is it all private? My answer is always yes. Okay? There will be some that are all public. There will be some that are all private. Most everybody will be in the middle. It's a slider. Some may tend to public. Some may tend to private. But they will be in the middle. It will be a hybrid world. 
guess what? What did we just spend yesterday focusing on the keynote? What are we spending focusing on in the work that we've been doing this week? What are we talking about? And guess what? What do our customers resonate the most with? This message. Because you know what this means?